Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our King. Sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth. Sing to Him a psalm of praise. Welcome Fleetwood International. Good morning. And also welcome to FIC House Churches. Gather these small clusters in homes to pray, to worship, respond to the sermon and fellowship together. And also a warm welcome to first time viewers of this church at home uh, and the church family. If you're visiting us for the first time, a warm welcome to you. And also if you are at the sanctuary right now, uh, you're most welcome and I hope to see you again next week. Couple of announcements. I would like to encourage you to join us with Zoom prayer meeting every 7 p.m. Wednesday and Bible Olympics on November 14. Please register on Pursuit Instagram account or through our website. For those not yet connected with the house church but would like to be, we, we ask that you, could, you would contact the church office by phone or email and request to be put in contact with the house church host and we will get you through. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we glorify and worship your name today. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your faithfulness in our lives. We believe that you are a sovereign God. We worship your name for who you are, what you are, and what you're going to do in us. Father, we entrust you our life our prayer today is that you cleanse us with your precious blood, seal us by the power of your Holy Spirit, and make us worthy to come to you, that apart from you we can do nothing. We acknowledge your presence and your Holy Spirit to work in our lives. Minister to us every day, Father God. And thank you for, for your goodness during this uh, season, that even though it is a pandemic, we believe, Father God, you are a sovereign, that you reign, Father God. And we know, Lord God, that you are in control of everything, that our, your people is protected. Your people, Lord God, we're going to get through this, Father. And Lord, we pray that every heart will be attentive to your word, to the worship. And Lord, we ask that the Holy Spirit will continue to work in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. Thank you once again for joining in worship here with us. Praise the Lord together, amen. What to say, Lord, it's you who gave me life to die. Can't explain just how much you mean to me now. You have saved me, Lord. I give all that I am to you. And every day I can be a light that shines your name.
is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Sing it out. Here's our scripture reading for the day. Our scripture reading is coming from the book of Luke, chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonged to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he, for he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. May the Lord bless our time in his word this morning. Thank you. Hey, good morning, church. So glad to have you here today, this morning with us. Those of you gathering in house churches, a special greeting up to you. We were so excited as a staff to hear Monday morning that over 30 house churches started across the city, and we're looking this week to add more to that number. And so celebrate that as you gather and continue to build into each other's lives this week, continue to get to know each other, pray for each other, help each other out as you're able to, and, and really, really dig into that fellowship together. Our passage this morning, we are in the Gospel of Mark, and we're looking at chapter 1, verses 14 to 19. And this passage is going to help us with a few questions. How do we hear from God? How do we encounter God in our lives today? How do we do that confidently? And so as we look at this passage, we're going to be going into a few other areas of scripture that are going to build that up. And so let's just launch into it today. I'm reading from the NIV, Mark 1, 14 to 19. Let's read together. 
After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. We'll begin with a, a question for you this morning. When you think of, just in your minds though, when you think of the apostles, especially these early disciples of Jesus, what comes to mind? I'm, I'm guessing that Maybe something, some kind of a classical painting or stained glass window comes to mind where we see the apostles and they're, they're shown as saints with maybe halos around their head and some kind of baby angels flying around them. And so there's this communication that these, these men are somehow transcendent in, in some way. And we feel like there's something extremely special about them. Would you be surprised that the gospel writers intentionally show us just how normal these men were. And not just normal, but the gospel writers actually show us intentionally how flawed these men were who began to follow after Jesus. This intentionality is there so that we can see that there's a progression for any man or woman that begins to follow Jesus. There's a progression where they're kind of a diamond in the rough. And then there's this progression of walking with Jesus, knowing Jesus better, hearing the voice of Jesus. And then there's someone, something truly incredible on the other end of that. And so this morning, I want to walk with you. I'm going to focus in on the two brothers, James and John. I'm going to look at their story together. These are, these are the two brothers, that, sons of Zebedee, but they are the sons of thunder, uh, as Jesus nicknamed them. And so let's find out a little bit together just how normal these men were and a little bit about their flaws. So turn with me. The first gospel writer that shows, or that I want to look at together that shows this, is actually Luke. So let's go to Luke chapter 9, 51 to 56 together. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. So they're in Samaria. Remember, the, the, the Jews and the Samaritans didn't necessarily get along. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. Then he and his disciples went to another village. And so James and John, they, they want to destroy this town. And, and not, only, uh, not only is it a, a destruction uh, that's just unique to here, but it's a destruction that the, the gospel writer is actually referring us back to the destruction of Sodom. What James and and John have in mind is that they want to call down fire on this town and completely obliterate it. And yet, this shows us how far away their heart was and their thoughts were to the hearts and thought of Jesus. Because Jesus, he came to save people in his ministry. Even save some of those who initially rejected him. We don't know, perhaps on the side of heaven, we'll actually run into some of those Samaritan villagers and we'll find out that they came to saving faith at a later point in time. But what does this snapshot that Luke gives us, what does this snapshot tell us about how well James and John really knew Jesus and how much they actually understood about the kingdom that he was proclaiming at this time? Let's continue. This is is just one snapshot. It gives us a glimpse of who they are as very, very ordinary men. Let's go back to the Gospel of Mark, and let's go to chapter 10 together, and let's read 35 to 40 together. And this is the request, request of James and John. 
Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. Can you see the ambition that's in the hearts of these men? They still view Jesus at this point as coming in. He's going to be a conquering king that's going to take on Rome. And when he does conquer, they want to be on his right and left in places of honor. These are ambitious men. And they still had the wrong idea of Jesus at this point. And they still had the wrong concept of how he was entering into and engaging with the world. And yet, we know that these brothers, they would go on to drink that same cup that Jesus drank. Because some years later, in the book of Acts, if you remember back to Peter's miraculous escape, we know that at that time, James has already been put to death by King Herod. And so these words of Jesus, they, they come true for these men. And so I hope you can see it, that there's a, a progression, a development that happens as they follow Jesus. And the gospel writers, they, they share some of this development with us. So these two brothers, they had time away alone with Jesus when the, the other disciples weren't present. They experience ministry side by side with Jesus. They are uh, two of the three who are present at the transfiguration. They take in, they spend a lot of time taking in the teaching of Jesus. And the end result of this long progression of these imperfect men and ordinary men is that later on they are described, I believe, by Paul as pillars of the church later in life. And it's actually these men who Jesus selects to be with him in his final hour in the Garden of Gethsemane. And so there's a real progression as these men follow after Jesus. From day one, coming out of their boats, to that final day in the garden, to even further on when they're leading the church. And here's our reality today, friends. We are all in progression. A progression of development as we follow Jesus. We're all in a progression. And what I would say to some of you today is don't talk yourself out of starting to follow Jesus because of who you are and where you're at now. That doesn't disqualify you. You just have a starting point, same as these men did, same as I did, same as all of us here at FIC. There's a starting point. Don't disqualify yourself by thinking you're not good enough or special enough. Because we see that it's God's desire for ordinary, everyday people to follow after Jesus. That's the first thing that this scripture in Mark shows us. It's God's desire for ordinary people, you and I, to follow after Jesus. Now, it doesn't stop there. This passage continues and continues to show us what God's heart is, what God's desire is. And I think the second point is that it's God's desire for us to encounter him in our lives. It's his desire for that. These brothers, they encounter him in the flesh, being called from the beach, being called from their boats. And yet we get asked the question, how do we encounter God today? How do you and I encounter God today? Because Jesus is risen and he's ascended into heaven. He's not here on the earth at this time. And so how do we encounter God? And the answer to that is largely by his spirit today. And that is actually by God's design. Let's go there together in the 
Gospel of John, chapter 16, verse 7, and there'll be a few verses after that. So these are the words of Jesus. But very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So the Holy Spirit, the advocate, is sent from heaven, sent by Jesus, and we, we see that sending happen in the, in the book of Acts. Let's continue here in, in John a little bit further down. Verse 12. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. Okay, there's a, there's a promise, there's a reality about the Holy Spirit. He's going to guide us. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it, because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. Okay, what the Spirit reveals to us is from Jesus. This is how Jesus continues to communicate us today, to us today. This is how we encounter Jesus today, by his Spirit. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. And so we've got this encounter with God that happens and is, is by the design of Jesus for us to be experiencing in this life. We're to be encountering God by his Spirit. We're to be encountering him, I think, very specifically. We're to be encountering him very relationally. And I think we're to encounter the Spirit regularly. And two questions come out of this when we, we talk about hearing from the Spirit or being encouraged by God's Spirit. Two core questions come out of it. The first is, how can we be confident that we've heard from the Spirit and that we're not just deluding ourselves? How can, we, how can we be confident that we've heard God's counsel and it's not just our, our own thoughts or our own framework that's coming up? So that's the first question. And the second one is, it's just as important, and I think even maybe more significant for our day and age, is how do we, or what, protects us from people making claims of God told me, and then pushing you in whatever direction they say God told you? How do we protect ourselves in that situation? How do we walk a true path there? Well, friends, I believe that God protects us in two ways. And I really like the imagery from, from Tolkien in The Lord of the Rings for this. We're going to borrow an image uh, from one of his books. And, and these are the Sentinels of Numenor, okay? And they, they guard the river as, as the river winds into their territory. And we have our own Sentinels as Christians. We have two of our own Sentinels that protect us in our thinking and in our worldview. And these sentinels, they, they, if, if we will allow them to do their work, it should result in only things of God being able to flow through into our lives. And so the first sentinel that God has given us is Scripture. The revelation of God, the teaching of Jesus, the writings of the early church that have been canonized together. That has been given to us by God. And this the second sentinel, the first one is, is well known. You might have even, even guessed it was there. The second one, I might have to describe it more for you. I think the second sentinel that helps protect us and, and guards our, our minds and guards our worldviews is, I, I think, tradition. Tradition. Now, when I say tradition, I bet for many of you, the first image comes to your mind is fiddler on the roof. You just hear those words, tradition, tradition. All right, that's not what I'm getting at. Not that kind of tradition. What I mean by Christian, Christian tradition and our tradition here is that God has led and spoken to men and women consistently. Consistently and clearly over time and in a variety of geographic, separated geographic locations around the world. And his message has been consistent during that. And we can look back in our tradition. Our tradition begins in the book of Acts, where we see how the early church functioned. 
and our tr tradition continues into the church father, so the, the man who, who wrote and, and taught uh, one generation out of the, the first apostles and the, the first generation of the church, and who, who maybe personally knew the apostles. And we go from there, there's different councils that come together where uh, right thinking is talked about and, and God's spirit moved and worked in those councils and our, our Bible was formed at those councils. And our Baptist tradition emerges in there as well. This is our tradition because godly men and women have looked at the scriptures in a consistent way and understood the scriptures in a consistent way and followed God in a consistent way. And we can use that to protect our minds, protect our hearts and our worldview. And so I want to walk us through a couple of examples of how do these guardians, if you want to call them that, or how do these sentinels of scripture and tradition, how do they work out in protecting us? And my first example that I have for you today is if you would go back to the 90s with me. And in the 90s, I, I, was, I was still a kid in the 90s, but I grew up hearing about this movement that happened, and I, I saw people who were affected by it. So around the mid-90s, this church in Toronto has what's called the Toronto Blessing. I think it's the airport church out in Toronto, and they have what's called the Toronto Blessing, and, and blessing you'd want to put in quotation marks because there's a, a lot of heated debate about whether it was a, a blessing or not what happened. But this Toronto blessing was what was believed by that church to be a movement of God's spirit in a new way. And one of the teachings that came out of that movement at that time was that the spirit of God was leading men and women to worship God and be edified in the worship service by barking like dogs and by roaring like lions in the service. And so we, we take that idea, we take that concept, and some leaders at the time were saying, this is, this is something new that God has revealed, we want to go that way. And some of the, the followers of that way of thinking even went to, from church to church trying to, to spread this idea. And so we take this idea, and what leaders of churches at that time needed to do, they needed to take this idea and they needed to look at it with Scripture. So the first sentinel of Scripture in the situation, okay, in any of the New Testament where, let's say, Paul talks about Christian worship, does he mention or is there any context where barking like dogs or roaring like lions was practiced or endorsed? And no, we don't see that. So the first sentinel puts his hand up and puts a stop to this thought and this new idea from continuing on. And then we look back at our church tradition. And we're part of the Baptist tradition here at FIC, and it's, a, it's not the only good tradition, but it's one of the good tr Christian traditions out there. And we look back on our Baptist tradition, and nowhere mainstream in our history do we see gatherings of worship where there are men and women gathered together to speak out sounds of animals. And so the second sentinel, the sentinel of tradition would put its hand up and stop this from going any further. And so if this movement, if this thought or this idea were to reemerge today or something like it, we would want to go to these two sentinels of scripture and tradition and we would want to see if they would allow it to pass through and flow into our lives. So this is a, a corporate way of working this out, of, of knowing whether we've heard from the Spirit of God or not. I've got one more corporate one for you, and that's there's a, a professor uh, who teaches at a, a local Christian institute here in, in Vancouver area, and this professor has this message, that God is happy for people to have gay identities, gay relationships, and gay marriages. And this, this professor would say that they, they know by, by God's spirit that this is something that uh, I think they would say has been revealed to them. And so we've got to take it. We've got to go to our first sentinel of scripture. And so I'll read for you. You can go there too if you want, if you're interested in this. First Timothy. Let's go there together. First Timothy. Let me read for us. 
1 Timothy chapter 1, starting verse 9. We also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and irreligious, for those who kill their fathers and mothers, for murderers, for the sexually immoral, for those practicing homosexuality, for slave traders and liars and per perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to the, to the sound doctrine that conforms to the gospel concerning the glory of the, of the blessed God, which he entrusted to me. Okay, so, so scripture would, would be countering this uh, this thought by this professor, and let's, let's keep looking. One more scripture. It's good to get a few scriptures if you can find them together on, on a topic. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idol, idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. This is a really important part that I would bring forward here. This is what some of you were. So you've been brought out with it. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And so we go to Scripture and we we oppose this thinking. And let's say we, we bring this scripture to this professor, and I've actually know people who, who have, and the response is very interesting. And it's the reason why we actually need our second sentinel. Because this teacher would say, I know scripture better than you do. I know its origins. I know where it came from. I know what it's really saying here. They would this professor would also say, and I know God's heart better than you do. And they, they would use that to somehow endorse, in their mind, endorse Scripture and say that Scripture is on their side, but that we over here right now are just not interpreting it properly. And that's where a sent second sentinel of tradition comes in. And we look and we say, okay, anywhere in our Baptist tradition, or anyone in, from the, the early church fathers, any of their writings, any of the councils of the church, do we see an endorsement here of these thoughts? And we would say, no, we don't see an endorsement of gay identities, gay relationships, or gay marriages. And so both our sentinels put their hands up, and they stop us from continuing down this path of error. And we would respond to that professor in, in love, and we would just say, look, we, we would believe that you're in error on this, and this is why we believe that, and we'd, we'd, we'd love to see you have a change of heart and change of mind with it. That's how we would engage these sentinels in these corporate issues where people are claiming to hear from God's Spirit. But I, want to, I don't want to just leave it on the corporate side this morning. I actually want to bring it over and bring it into our personal lives right now. I want to bring it into how do we hear and how do we confident, confidently move forward believing that we, and knowing that we've heard from Jesus Christ, we've had an encounter with him and heard his voice through his spirit. Well, I want to bring you some more examples. I want to bring you the examples from the lives of two, two friends of mine. Now, the, the first friend, both of these friends believe that they, they heard from God. And these are actual stories uh, from, from my friends, and they're okay with me sharing these. My first friend, he was just praying about it, praying about, he had a new job, and he was praying about what to do with some of the, the money. He, was, he was, had an increase in, in wage, and he was, went into prayer with it, and he just shared with me at one of our, our times where we get together, he said, you know, God just really led me to uh, begin giving in a big way to make uh, the digging of wells happen in different parts of the African Sahara where there are no wells so that these whole villages can have water supply. And these wells are expensive. And so we got talking, I just asked him, so are you like doing this in, in place of a tithe? He said, no, that's not what God talked to me about. He said, no, God just said, and spoke to me, he said that I should take some of the money that I'm making and give beyond my tithe, and I should be making this ministry happen. I should be supporting it. 
And so we, we go to the scripture, we can go to scripture and we can, we can see that, okay, there's, there's nothing that would counter in that. In fact, this, this action and what he's heard from the spirit would actually be supported, uh, would be supported by scripture. This is similar to some of the gifts to the poor that were happening that please God. We see that in the scripture. And, uh, and so we also have these echoes that from scripture to what he's living out, what the spirit's telling him to do. So there's these echoes of, if you remember the gifts of the Gentiles to the, the, Jew, the Jewish believers at the time, because they were going through a time of famine. famine. And so you, you can see these echoes of building new wells, and you could, you could very easily see that of being potentially part of the, the story of Acts. You could see the early Christian church doing that. And because of that, both scripture and the sentinel tradition would welcome that action in, and that would be affirming that this was a move and a, a move of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit speaking and leading in my friend's life. Now, the second story is, is about finances too, and it's humorous to look back on, and we were pretty young when this happened, but again, I'll go back to it's late 90s, early 2000s, and, uh, and my second friend here, he comes up to our, our, our like our guy's study group one week, and he says, you know what? I think God would have me stop tithing so that I can stop pirating music and I can start purchasing CDs. He came to us one week saying that. And, and he was serious about it, that this is, this is what we want to do. And for, for those of you that aren't old enough to, to know a world before music streaming, there was. You actually had to go buy a CD at one point, or when it first came online to... There weren't so many platforms where you could, you could stream from, and so a lot of people just pirated music. And so my friend, he felt like, okay, this is morally wrong. God must be happy if I just take my tithe, stop giving to the church, stop supporting the church, and I just buy my music with that money instead. And so you would go into Scripture, our, our two sentinels, you go into Scripture, and nowhere do we see in the early church where people stop being generous and supporting church ministry or missions activity within the church. No one does that so they can have more of something that they like themselves. We don't see that happening anywhere in scripture. And in our Baptist tradition, you know, when we, we read about it, when we, when we listen to accounts of how we started, we don't see that there anywhere. anywhere. We see the, the opposite. So there's not canceling out tithe in order to have more of something I enjoy. There's, in fact, an increase in generosity within our tradition. Our, our tradition is to be extremely generous people out in the world. And so our, our sentinels, I think both their hands would be up, both tradition and scripture, and they'd be saying, no, this is not of God's spirit. This is not God leading in this thought. So two friends, two very different outcomes by putting these sentinels in place when both believed strongly that they had heard from God's spirit and wanted to move forward with what they had heard. So, how do you engage with God's Spirit today? Well, I would encourage you, one of the practices that I would encourage you to do is, is to just take up prayer journaling. Now, what prayer journaling is, is where ideally you find a beautiful spot. I love going out on our church property and just being under the trees, sitting around a picnic table, and you take 20 to 30 minutes to deliberately have an encounter with God. And you take that time and you say, Lord, I, I want to meet with you right now. And by the scripture we've just been in, we know that God wants to be with you in that moment as well. He wants you to encounter him. And God will come. God will show up if you give him those kinds of moments in your days and in your weeks. And he will come and he will guide you. He will come and he will show something to you something about your life that he wants to speak to. He will come and he will give you something, a word of encouragement, a word of direction, a word of guidance for you. He will come and he will heal you in those moments. He'll forgive you of if you have any sin burdens that you're just hanging on to guilt with. He'll come and he'll meet you in those moments and they're powerful. But are we willing to have them? Are we willing to take the time from our busy schedules and have an encounter with him? And so prayer journaling, I would definitely encourage that. And men, specifically for you, if you go onto our men's ministry page, I want to recommend this book to you. 
This is my fall read, and you can find it. You can find the link of where to get it through our men's ministry page on the FIC website. This book is Odyssey by Justin Kemp, and it's designed for men. It's designed for men who are starting out maybe for the first time and having these encounters with God so that we can step into life, we can be dads, we can, we can be brothers, we can be sons who can move forward in faith, confident that we're hearing from God's Spirit, hearing from Jesus Christ as we move through life. So I'd encourage you to pick it up. It's well worth the, the investment into it. And so these personal times with God's Spirit, we always want to give God our time. We want to confidently listen to God's Spirit because His Word says that He wants to meet with us and speak to us in this way. But we should always, either at the front end or at the tail end of these times, we should always have Scripture. We should be checking what we're, we think we're hearing from God we should always be checking it with Scripture. And this underlines a really important practice that the more Scripture that you have been through and are familiar with, the stronger your sentinel is so that you can know where to go to check on certain topics that he talks to you about, certain areas of life that he brings to your attention. And I would encourage you even to look at the type of Bible that you use. Now, by type of Bible, I don't mean which translation. NIV or NLT are two of my favorites, but you can get a reference Bible or you can get an interlinear Bible that has a center column. All that that does is that when you're in a particular passage of Scripture, it'll show you connecting Scriptures that speak about the same topic so that you're not only just figuring out one Scripture on its own, trying to, dis trying to distinguish what exactly it's saying. You can look at a few together and that keeps you having a, a strong sentinel of Scripture that's protecting you. So the second point here that is, I want to expand on is that it's God's desire for you and I to know Him by encountering Him regularly. We can do that by His Spirit. My third and my, my final point as we, as we go through today and as we look at this passage where Jesus is calling his first disciples here in Mark, in the very beginning of Mark, and it's that it is God's desire for us to follow after Jesus before following after anything else in life. Who or what are you choosing to follow today? Because there are many, many common things that humans follow after in place of God and in place of Jesus Christ. And there's an, actually an ancient book that's in our Bible that speaks about these common things that are followed after. The human reality is that these are consistent alternates to following after God, and yet they're meaningless. And you may have guessed it, but that would be the book of Ecclesiastes. If you go back to Psalms, Ecclesiastes is uh, just coming up if, next door, just very close to the Psalms. Find the Psalms and you'll find Ecclesiastes not too far away. This is an ancient book chronicling lots of the experiences of, I believe, King Solomon. And I'll be honest, it's like a cold bucket of water when you read Ecclesiastes. It wakes you up. You don't particularly enjoy it, but it's good for you. And it challenges us with what are we following after? And I would just encourage you, the link below this sermon on our webpage will take you to the Bible Project video that summarizes Ecclesiastes. This is a really good eight minutes that's worth your investment. But Ecclesiastes, at the heart of it, is challenging us. It, and it's giving us some wisdom. And it, it asks us, what are you following after? In this life that is so brief, in this life that ends in death for everybody, rich or poor, wise or foolish, what are you chasing after? What are you spending your time and effort and energy on? Is it wealth? Are you giving all you've got to the pursuit of wealth and personal gain? Is it prestige and excellence? Maybe you want to be the, the best and brightest in a specific field. 
Is it a political ideology that you follow after before following after Jesus? And Ecclesiastes has this great saying, Hevel, Hevel, everything is Hevel. And Hevel is translating it as meaningless. Everything is meaningless. The idea is these things are temporary. If you were to chase after those things, those are temporary. It's like chasing after the wind. just slips through your fingers. Before you know it, you're, you're old or you're dead and buried. And so the King Solomon is, is trying to point us to the reality that pursuit or following after those things in the grand picture is meaningless. And it stands, Ecclesiastes stands in contrast to the writings of the Gospels and who we know Jesus to be. That there is, in Jesus Christ, an absolute solid rock to stand in for both this life and the next. And if we follow after him, unlike all those things that are mentioned in Ecclesiastes, it will not be meaningless. It will be meaningful. The grand picture here is that it is futile to chase after, to pursue anything other than following after Jesus Christ. And so this morning there's a decision to be made for us. Our text brings us to a decision. And it has to be made, will I choose today to chase after these things, these temporary things, or will I choose to chase after, follow after Jesus Christ? And to the undecided who are gathered with us today, or if you're, you're listening in on, on YouTube maybe a few weeks from this sermon time, will you spend your life chasing the wind or will you begin following after Jesus today? That's the question for you. You can start on that path with him. And to you and I, brothers and sisters, to Christians, will you guard your life and follow Jesus clearly and consistently? Will you do that instead of putting these other pursuits that in the end are hovel, hovel? Will you put him before those other pursuits? Let me pray for you this morning. Father, as we, we close today, we recognize the reality that it's your desire for ordinary, everyday people like us to follow after Jesus Christ. We recognize that it's your desire for us to know him by encountering him in our lives, in our weeks, in our days, through the Holy Spirit. And Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters that they would, those who would attempt, maybe for the first time, to encounter you, to do that prayer journaling, Lord, I just ask that you give them a real taste of who you are, of your counseling, of you coming and reminding us of things in the Word, and how specific and how concrete and encouraging your leading can be for us, how refreshing it is when you lead us. And Lord, we understand that it's your desire for us to follow after Jesus before anything else in our life. And so Lord, where we have come and we have put things, where we've been pursuing things instead of Jesus Christ, Lord, would you put that at the forefront of our minds right now? Would you shape our thinking? Would you give us a conscious, conscience about those things today? Lord, we want to be like those men in the boats at the beginning of Mark here. And we want to jump out and we want to say yes to following Jesus today. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you today. Church, as we take the message this morning and respond to it, let's just remember that we have been called to be followers of Christ. So let us draw near to him as he calls us to his presence. Draw me close to you Never let me go 
I lay it all down again To hear you say that I'm your friend You are my desire No one else will do Cause nothing else can take your place To feel the warmth of your embrace Help me find a way Bring me back to you You're all I want You're all I've ever needed You're all I want Help me know you are near Draw me close Draw me close to you Never let me go I lay it all down again To hear you say that I'm your friend You are my desire No one else will do Cause nothing else can take your place To feel the warmth of your embrace Help me find a way Bring me back to you, to you, oh Lord, you're all I want, Jesus, you're all I've ever needed, you're all I want, Jesus. Our response today for God's message is that we would like to continue to say yes to the invitation of Jesus to follow Him. In rhythm of our week, we want to continue to make space to have encounters with God. A Bible study on this week's sermon on Mark 1 is posted below this video. Use it as a guide for discussion in your life group or your for personal study. Again, thank you for your generous giving to the ministry we are called as a church. E-transfer is now an option for donations with instruction as fichurch.org slash give. Three questions from sermon will now be shown on your screen. Please pause the video and take a few minutes to share discussion in your house church. John 15.5 says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Have a blessed week ahead. And thank you for joining us today.